Oh yeah. Yay. All right. Good morning. And uh, yes, again, I have to say this uh, during the live stream. Apologies for this uh, confusion. It is my fault. I will be more careful in the future uh, and uh, try not to repeat it to my best ability, of course. So this is uh, the 138th episode of Japanese Politics One-on-One -on -one with CEO of Langley Squire, Timothy Langley who is here with us again. It's a pleasure to see you this morning, Timothy, with your new makeup and mustache. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. And for, um, of course, in advance, thank you for sharing with us uh, the insights and uh, you know the latest happenings uh, in Japanese politics. So without any further ado, I'll give you the floor. And uh, of course, I invite everybody who is watching us uh, to share uh, their comments and uh, questions uh, in the platform uh, which you're currently watching us at. And then after Timothy is done with the briefing, I'll share them with him. That's it. Timothy, you ready to go? I am ready to go, Maya. Great. Here we go then. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 138th consecutive briefing on Japanese politics. Nowhere in the world are you going to find a briefing in English on Japanese politics, only here on, uh, on Maya's platform. And the title of our show is Japanese Politics One-on-One. -on -one. And it's called One-on-One -on -one because there is a uh, question and answer component after the briefing. And I try and keep these briefings, as you know, as tight and as brief as possible. I rarely um, keep it to 30 minutes. I, I go over too often. I'll try and keep it uh, brief today. But this is to give everybody in the audience um, insight into what's going on, what's happened over the last week uh, that is um, important to, to you, to the audience, to what's going on in Japan and the, the Japanese economy, in business culture with the prime minister and that sort of thing. So um, uh, if you have questions about things that we're talking about or if you want us to talk about things that we haven't mentioned, just um, write a comment to Maya and we can address them after the briefing. So um, getting on to uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Kishida, he is one of our favorite topics on this uh, briefing. And by the way, uh, to the audience, if you haven't been uh, listening um, regularly, we talk about things that have been happening in the past. We don't dwell on them too much. We're trying to give you the, uh, the new insights. So if we're talking about things and you're trying to catch up, uh, perhaps you need to um, just listen to some of the uh, previous uh, episodes. So, for example, today we're going to be talking about um, what's going on in the Philippines and the fight between the Philippine fisheries and the China's, China Coast Guard, and also with the, um, the fellow who escaped into North Korea about uh, two months ago. Um, so some of the background uh, we just uh, skim over, but the news we talk about. So with that... Um, the Prime Minister came back from uh, almost a week in New York City where he was at the UN uh, two weeks ago. So this last week has been very busy with him. He made some important policy speeches. He made a couple of decisions towards the end of the week, like on Friday. Um, finally, the LDP and the Prime Minister's office decided when they would hold a uh, an extraordinary diet session. So constitutionally, the Japanese government is supposed to hold a diet session from January for 150 days. It goes usually till June or July, um, but frequently there, uh, the prime minister or perhaps a coalition of members of the parliament will call for an extraordinary diet session. And this has happened um, with uh, increasing regularity and particularly with regard to uh, launching a supplementary budget. So they launch a budget, they put together a budget, they pass the budget uh, right in, um, in April, uh, right towards the middle of the diet session. And that's supposed to carry them through uh, until uh, the next year. Actually, the, the budget that they have is for the next year. It starts from April 1st in the next year. That's the budget that they pass in April. And so we're living into the budget that was proposed uh, a year ago. Uh, and 
there are tweaks that need to be made, obviously, particularly with regard to uh, wages not being uh, able to keep up with the inflation rate. The inflation rate has um, really kept away from the Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance. The prime minister is uh, really scratching his head trying to keep these wages uh, going, even though there was a um, a record uh, wage increase this last session during the spring offensive with uh, the, the labor markets and uh, the uh, with industry. Can you turn your mic off, please, Maya? Sure. Um, and uh, even in light of that uh, incredible wage increase that the um, Japanese uh, working population hasn't had in 25 years, uh, the inflation rate being the real inflation rate uh, being uh, probably around 4.5 three percent, but the published uh, inflation rate is at about three, three point one, three point two percent. But people are suffering because even though their in, their uh, wages might have increased by uh, two percent or one point nine percent, the inflation is eating into that. So it's stalling the economy. The prime minister came back from New York, all full of, you know, um, achieving lots of diplomatic and geopolitical results. Uh, burnishing the image of him as the leader of Japan and, and establishing himself as a, a, a world a participant in, in politics and what's going on with Ukraine. It's now time for him to come back and focus on what's going on domestically. It is not his forte. He is a um, career uh, foreign ministry um, uh, specialist. He was the longest serving uh, foreign minister, as you know, under the Abe administration. And now as prime minister, he's having a little bit of struggle with what's going on domestically. So one of the first things he's been addressing is the wages for the number of employees. So he, he shifted his, uh, his cabinet two, three weeks ago. Um, and so there are now 11 new ministers in the cabinet of 19. Plus, he has shifted some of the uh, players within the LDP administration. So there's the cabinet and the LDP. Um, and that's, that is about 25 people that have, uh, newly received their lease on life as a cabinet minister or as a top person within the LDP. Um, he's tasked these individuals with, uh, coming up with ideas and, uh, pull out all the stoppers on addressing the wage gap, inflation, and, uh, the economy, getting the economy back on track. And then on Friday, there was a big a bit of a kerfuffle between the LDP and the prime minister's office on when they are going to open the uh, extraordinary diet session. The LDP wanted the prime minister to campaign uh, as much as possible because there's an election for an upper house seat and a lower house seat on the 22nd of this month. By the way, today is August, um, October 1st. Um, wow, September just flew right by. And now it's a really serious time for the prime minister. The diet session will open on the 20th, which is a Friday. It'll open up and then they'll break in for the weekend. And the election for these two diet seats, one for the upper house and one for the lower house, will be that Sunday. So I think they designed it this way so that it would have maximum impact that the parliament and the the, uh, issues of what's going on in politics and um, the, the two diet seats being up for election that Sunday um, would be a forefront on the uh, public's eye. So uh, with regard to the by-elections, um, two seats were made available uh, because there was a resignation in the upper house and then a, um, a death in the lower house. And the time for that, if there, if there is a shift or if there's a resignation or a death, um, uh, a by-election needs to be held within uh, uh, several months of that, and there are only a couple of times of the year, and that happens on October 22nd. Um, both of these seats are, are held by LDP politicians, and the LDP wants to make sure that whoever wins as a candidate is also in the LDP, and that's not a sure deal. Uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, the opposition parties who are hot on the heels, and one of the the, the resignation was due to the Diet member being... Um, a little bit aggressive uh, power harassment uh, with one of his staff. It grew up and blew up into a a pretty big scandal. And he had to resign as a consequence of that. Um, So uh, the LDP is a little bit back on its heel because it needs to put in another candidate who is going to be better, 
who projects a, a cleaner, more stable image than the last candidate who held the seat, who um, was pretty abusive to uh, a former diet staff. So um, the you know the blood is in the water, and the opposition parties, particularly Ishin and the number one uh, opposition party, the Constitutional Democratic Party, are grooming their candidates. It hasn't been announced yet. It's it's um, the campaigning doesn't start. The campaigning period for the upper house and the campaign period for the lower house are different by a couple of days, um, and so that campaign uh, period will start towards the end of this this week. So you begin to hear more and more about the candidates, about the election. We'll report more uh, closely on it this time next week. But it is important for you to keep in mind that there are two by-elections that are going to be happening um, in the middle of this month that people will say this is a, um, a, a bellwether for how the LDP is doing. So if the LDP doesn't retain both of these seats, then people will come out and they'll, they'll flail the, their arms and they'll say that's because the LDP is not doing very well and the prime minister is, um, his credibility is lacking. They will make those, those assumptions. What the prime minister wants to do is he wants to open the diet. He wants to win both of these seats with the LDP. He wants to pass a supplemental budget during this extraordinary session that will blow your socks off. And then some pundits say, uh, call for a snap election while the energy is high and people are, um, convinced that the prime minister is thinking of their best interests. He's um, doiling out more subsidies. The cost of living uh, index will fall because of uh, the uh, deduction in cost that the government is basically uh, assuming. So there's a lot to be expected in the, towards the later part of this month, and we'll be following it and um, uh, reporting it to you. Another issue that has come up with the prime minister, there are a couple I'd like to talk about, but one important one that he, um, he he discussed on Friday was this kind of crunch that the economy is going to have um, with the reduction of the number of hours that truck drivers can um, use as overtime. So it's a pretty big deal. It's a bit of a sleeper, but I think you're going to hear an awful lot of it because the truck drivers, by, by law that goes into effect on April in just uh, seven months, their uh, overtime must be capped. And as a consequence of that, 14% of their workforce is going to be reduced. And calculations made by uh, the think tank here in Tokyo has predicted that the number and the volume of uh, goods coming into uh, the major metropolitan areas will decline as a consequence by about 32%. Um, and that is just untenable. Um, so, uh, one of the ideas is to raise prices for truck drivers, but as we already know, the number of people who are actually eligible and qualified for truck drivers and for um, just regular business uh, construction, for uh, techni technicians, that sort of thing, um, it has already declined. So uh, a crunch time is coming. There are a couple of issues that the prime minister needs to confront. One of those is autonomous vehicles, uh, not completely allowed here in Japan. There are a couple of test markets. But if they were to move, if Japan were to move where uh, trucks could be moved uh, autonomously throughout um, uh, the, the nation, delivering packages and goods, uh, that would be a, a, a big relief. But the number of overtime hours uh, per year logged by truck drivers is uh, 960 overtime hours per year. And um, the average overtime hours by um, nation, by, by, by in the entire nation of, of workers here, is 440 hours per year. That's a lot when you think about it. Those are overtime hours that are logged. Um, so the, uh, the prime minister and the labor department is uh, determined to reduce the number of hours that these fellows are getting. And uh, truck drivers, as you might suspect, are in the lower part of the economic scale. So uh, there's a huge, huge push that's going on there. You're going to see an impact on that. So I suspect over the next couple of months, proposals will be coming out, they'll be offered into the parliament, and probably legislation will be formed during this um, very delicate, uh, extraordinary session that will probably go about six weeks. 
It'll start in October 20th, probably October, November, maybe in the, the first week of December it will end, but it could end earlier. The uh, end point has not been decided, so we don't quite know. But one of the things that the prime minister is distinctly going to uh, challenge, because he's talked about it, he's uh, had a press conference on Wednesday coming back from uh, New York, where he was urging all of the ministers, 11 of whom are new, to come up with ideas to bolster the economy. And he wants to, um, he, he's actually instructed them in a meeting that he had on uh, Monday, on Tuesday to um, pull out all stops and use all possible tools to get this um, uh, uh, economy going, to mitigate the pain of inflation and to support the economy with pay hikes and investment. So um, one of the ideas is that uh, those companies that increase wages for workers will get a deduction for the taxes that they have to pay. And um, as likely as that is a tax that will be imposed on the major em employing companies, the, the big industries, that if they don't wage wages, uh, a, a certain tax will be applied to them. So a blanket tax that will be applied. And uh, for those people who are participating, a bit of a dispensation for that, which would probably last maybe two or three years to encourage people to uh, participate in that. And then it would be grandfathered so that it was three years um, and then end of life would be in three years. And hopefully the economy would take up after that. Um, so uh, this is something that the um, uh, we're going to anticipate seeing in this extraordinary diet session. And he's also outlined uh, later in the week his ideas for measures for wage goals. And so actually this is, whenever we talk about this issue, Maya, um, actually the hits to our, uh, our briefing increase. Sometimes Maya does clips on various segments and posts them. And when we talk about wages internationally, it gets a lot of attention. People are really interested in this. But um, the prime minister has acknowledged that since um, uh, the price hikes because of the yen and the fact that uh, imports come into Japan and exports go out. The imports are at a higher cost now because the yen is so weak and the exports don't generate as much revenue. So there's this, this crunch um, that he needs to deal with that with a, an array of measures to ease that burden and to boost the wages. And he wants to fund a new stimulus package, which the government will um, draft in the supplementary budget. People have said that um, the budget needs to be something in the range of 15 trillion, which is about uh, $101 billion to uh, 20 trillion yen. So um, I think uh, in order for the stimulus to actually work, it needs to be of such a, a huge volume. And the last one, uh, this time last year, was th the largest in uh, Japanese post-war history. And I think that they're probably going to exceed that because it needs to boost the economy. People need to really physically uh, notice it and get a um, an inspiration from that so that the economy, people feel a little bit better. They go out, they buy things, they make a vacation, they make a baby. Um, that kind of thing is what the prime minister is looking for. And the only way to, to really do that is, as, as uh, people in the administration understand, is really uh, jigger the economy, boost it up. The, um, as you might know, there's a, an... Um, uh, what is the name of it? It's called the um, uh, Qualified Invoice System. This is a new system that's going to affect from today where companies issue invoices for services and for um, products that they sell. It's a new system uh, to more firmly monitor and manage the economy. Um, a lot of people are... Um, upset with this because it's just another administrative um, ta uh, task that they must do to satisfy uh, the government receiving more benefits and receiving more taxes. Uh, for people on the lower end of the economy, for uh, smaller companies or for uh, the, uh, the freelancers, issuing these invoices means that they're more likely to get taxed than had they not uh, submitted that. And so the government is actually um, boosting their tax revenues with the implementation of this system. So the government, as, as we've um, revealed many times in the show, keeps spending money with the release of the Fukushima tainted water. 
um, the uh, the fisheries have complained about you know we're missing out on sales. China has completely cut off all fishery imports, um, forty two percent of which went to China um, because of this, and the Japanese government has given them billions of dollars for support. Um, everybody has their hand out for um, for subsidies. Uh, since the economy has really stalled, the government has also supported um, a price for gasoline and petroleum, which is one of the more expensive imports that Japan has. So uh, the money that is being spent is just enormous. People scratch their heads and wonder, where, where does this all come from? It's a different kind of economy, different kind of setup than in the United States where they can print money and it's a fractional reserve. Uh, the economy here is a little bit different. So at some point in time with the amount of money that the Japanese government spends compared to the amount of money that it brings in, uh, there is going to be, um, you know, hell to pay, but it is being pushed off. It is being, ha has been pushed off for about uh, uh, 30 years. In fact, the Japan, as you know, the debt to um, uh, revenue ratio of the Japanese government is far greater uh, than any country in the G20, and it is a perennial problem. The prime minister will probably not be addressing that much in this new uh, extraordinary diet, but still the money is being spent. Um, the other thing that's going on with the prime minister is that with among his uh, 11 new mi ministers to the cabinet, there are two in particular that are receiving a lot of uh, press scrutiny. You can anticipate that um, Miss Obuchi, who was in the LDP for election um, uh, strategy, and uh, the Minister of Defense, Mr. Kyura, um, uh, not Kyura, I'm sorry, it's uh, Kihara, Ms. Kihara Minoru, um, are getting a lot of attention uh, from the, not the mainstream press, but the uh, Bunshun type press. Uh, criticizing them for their use of money and funds and what they're doing with um, their supporters groups. So um, the knives haven't completely come out, except I think with, with Obuchi, you can say um, th there are a lot of people that are really um, attacking her uh, for sins that she's had in the past and sins that she has uh, recently committed. These are all coming out in the press. So the prime minister could have a little bit of a, a problem the last time he uh, launched his cabinet, when he became prime minister, uh, within um, two months, he had lost four of his ministers, as you remember. He doesn't want to have a repeat on this. Um, and so these are just kind of um, uh, ripples in the water at this point in time. We'll see. But I think with the supplemental budget and with the uh, extraordinary diet, you will see a lot of volatility coming up. So we've got uh, three weeks to wait for that. Um, the election of the upper house and the lower house will dictate how the prime minister is going to go, and um, it will be a, a pretty interesting time. The appointments, uh, when the prime minister shuffles his cabinet, he starts with the cabinet ministers and the LDP, and then several days later, they go to the vice ministers and the assistant directors, and then they go down to the LDP, um, the uh, appointments for uh, various uh, committees within the LDP. And then finally, there is a shuffle that occurs within committee uh, appointments within the parliament. Um, so the diet will start on the 20th of this month. And so we anticipate an announcement of who are having the committee chairs. That will be another reshuffle that will happen uh, maybe in uh, two weeks or so. We can anticipate that. So, um, you know, who's on first base, who's on second base, a lot of these positions will change and there will be a dynamism that we'll be able to um, uh, appreciate or interpret as a consequence of that. And through that, we can see where the prime minister is going. Is he going to call for a snap election or is he going to let this uh, extraordinary diet s session finish? We wrap up the year. We go into uh, January. January starts the new diet session, the constitutionally mandated 150-day uh, session. And within that session, yeah, the prime minister, his term of office, as you might remember, ends in September next year, 12 months away from now. So a lot is going to be happening and we're going to be able to read the tea leaves there. And if he's going to close the cabinet, the, uh, the diet for uh, an election, some people say it'll be 
uh, before the end of this year. I don't see it that way, but you never know because it is Japanese politics. Um, Travis King is the private who um, joined a group of people visiting the, the North Korean uh, sector, um, the, the, the point where North Korea and South Korea have uh, some sort of a communications, and it's a favorite spot for politicians and for tourists to go because you can actually look into North Korea from there. And he joined a, a, um, a group of tourists and then broke from the group and ran across and offered himself up to North Korea. He had been in trouble just the day earlier, you might remember if, uh, if you were attending our briefing on this in July, I think it was July uh, 20th or, or thereabout. Um, let me see. Yeah, I think it was about the, the, the 20th, um, the 10th actually. So um, he had been in an altercation in Seoul uh, got into a little bit of a, a trouble. The MPs were called. He was arrested, and he was being escorted to the airport the following day while in custody, and he broke away from uh, his guards, and he came back into Seoul. He joined this group that was visiting the, uh, the armistice area, and then he just broke over, and he ran into North Korea, if you can believe that. Of course, they arrested him, um, and uh, I think the United States just pretty much uh, wrote it off because there have been people who have sought asylum in North Korea. There have been people who have been arrested in North Korea while they were there legitimately for um, maybe causing some trouble or taking a poster off a wall or maybe even um, tourists coming in from China coming over into uh, to North Korea as a lot of people do. Um, so there have been about maybe 17 people who have been arrested, uh, Americans who have been arrested over the last 15 years. But this one was pretty dramatic with the, uh, the soldier, actually a kid, maybe 18, 19 years old, uh, sprinting across because he didn't want to go back to uh, Travis to be incarcerated for infractions that he committed in South Korea. So the, the amazing thing is that the, uh, the North Koreans, I guess they had their fill of Mr. Travis King, and they returned him through the, um, the intercession of Sweden and China, because there's no diplomatic relations between the United States and, uh, and North Korea, so there is no way to even have a dialogue on this kid. Uh, but through Sweden, they, they released him, and then he uh, was released back to the United States uh, just this week. So it's an interesting story. I guess they figured out Old Travis doesn't have any intelligence that is useful to us. And in fact, he's just a, a wayward kid that made a bad decision, decide to, uh, to come to North Korea. We don't want to have anything to do with that. And his value is, uh, is negative to us. So they returned him on Friday. So that's kind of an interesting piece of news. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is this relationship between China and Japan continues to just get higher and higher. You might have noticed that uh, uh, Takaichi Sanai was in, uh, I think, Vienna this last week to, in a conference, and there was a bit of an altercation. The Chinese um, uh, representative made his speech, and he was critical of Japan and the release of the, the, uh, the water from Fukushima and making lots of criticisms. And she came up and took the podium and really lambasted uh, China for their policies and their aggressive stance. So there's um, a gradual kind of increase. At, at some points um, and in some stages, this tension begins to uh, diminish. Um, uh, Premier Xi has got his own issues, uh, but it does seem to be rather worrying. Uh, Mitsubishi Motors has decided to pull out of China. So this is another kind of uh, indicator of this relationship. And uh, you can kind of imagine that Chinese uh, purchasers are not so hot on um, Japanese products. So they've banned all the fish, um, fish supplies, no more fish food coming in um, from, from Japan at all. Um, and that's, that's a huge hit. And um, also the, the products, Japanese products are um, highly competitive. They're, they have a high quality uh, and status in China. But for Mitsubishi to be pulling out, that's a big deal. That's a production facility. 
they're going to sell it to their Japan, their Chinese partner. So as you know, when you um, establish any kind of a uh, enterprise in China, you have to have uh, Chinese partners uh, with you, sometimes uh, to the degree that they own 51% or 50% of the, uh, of the operation from the get-go. Um, so they've got to uh, relinquish their shares there, the machinery, all of that thing that is involved in that. And um, one of the issues is just that Mitsubishi wasn't that aggressive on developing um, electric vehicles. And in China, the vast majority of cars that are being sold are electric vehicles, and China is really uh, pushing electric vehicles. Um, so that might be one reason, but I think it is um, indicative of this this atmosphere between China and Japan, and it's not it's not really improving very much. Um, this uh, trilateral relationship between Viet, um, uh, South Korea, Japan, and the United States is continuing to become more and more robust. You might remember that. Uh, President Joe Biden visited Vietnam uh, maybe three weeks ago. They signed a lot of trade deals, and the United States is really wooing uh, Vietnam, who is a border state, a border neighbor with uh, with China, with um, arms deals and uh, and trade trade agreements. So currently, Vietnam receives a lot of support from Russia for their military wares, and the United States is attempting to wean them away from uh, the Russian uh, military products and get uh, U.S. products uh, there. So the, uh, an, an important deal was signed over the weekend um, to uh, further embellish. So who knows what Vietnam will do in the long term, but right now the United States is hell-bent on developing this, this cadre, this, this um, group of like-minded nations as a bulwark against uh, China and China's potential aggression towards Taiwan. But it goes far bigger than that. It also deals with Ukraine and also the, um, the Russian advance and kind of threatening posture towards the, uh, the northern islands uh, above Hokkaido. So there's, there's a lot going on there as well. So the, the fact that um, the United States is really cozying up to, to Vietnam and also the trilateral relationship with South Korea and Japan uh, all of these things are indicators that, the, you know, hopefully it is a, a, a successful deterrent effect, but you just never know. Taiwan just launched its first indigenous submarine, a 70 meter long um, submarine. It is the first in a series that they will begin to build. It's the first for Taiwan. This is a huge uh, game changer for, uh, for China. I think they, um, the, the first one that came off the, um, the uh, the shipyard uh, cost about 1.5 billion dollars. Um, they are planning another one and a fleet um, within the next uh, 10 years. So they were going to con going to continue to build these submarines, uh, diesel powered, um, highly advanced. The Dutch government has sold two submarines to Taiwan. So this this increasing amount of of armament and um, preparation for something that could be kinetic. Sometimes it just generates a kinetic activity because there's so much going on there. And I think the flashpoint that we need to be careful of is the one that's in the Philippines. So you might uh, know, well, we talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago. There is a, um, a uh, on the Spratly Islands, there is a shoal that is above water, just basically above water at, at uh, low tide. And a ship has been launched there by the Philippines. It's stuck on the shoal, and it is um, garrisoned with uh, Philippine Marines. So it is an occupied kind of island. Um, the Chinese went uh, far beyond that. They actually poured uh, cement and sand and created uh, various islands in the area. And China actually occupies and insists that uh, the South China Sea essentially belongs to them. There is another series of shoals where the Philippine fishermen go to fish and the Chinese have drawn uh, fishing nets over uh, the entrance to these shoals, preventing the, Philippine, the Filipina, uh, Filipino fishermen from, from going in there. This has caused yet another clash, the Coast Guard and the fishers. And I think this is developing either the Spratleys or the uh, Scarborough Shoals 
are developing into a, a real flashpoint. You probably don't remember, but during the Obama administration, this was also an issue around 2012. And um, there was a confrontation and the United States stepped in and they made things nice. And the Philippines under uh, Rodrigo Duterte as president, he was very uh, close to China at that time. They made a cessation of kind of hostilities. They separated and the United States was somewhat of an arbiter and then the Chinese broke uh, their rules and they went back in. And so since then, the Chinese have uh, pretty much dominated that. The Philippines is really angry at the United States for allowing that to happen. The United States is now trying to amend, re, uh, mend these ties and coming in a little bit more, more strongly. But with the fishermen coming in and this clash, potential clash between the Chinese Coast Guard and these fishers um, does insist or does demand that the United States also come to the aid of the Philippines. So if there's going to be a flash and a configuration, it, it could uh, actually start uh, somewhere not right uh, on the, uh, the Taiwan um, island or in the seas there, but uh, actually a little bit further south. So it's something to, to continue to watch. Um, the other thing going on with the Pacific Islands is Joe Biden, as you might recall when he attended G20, um, rather than going to Indonesia first and then to uh, um, uh, India, he bypassed Indonesia, went to India, and then visited Vietnam. Uh, he was supposed to go to uh, the, uh, a conference of the Pacific Islands. He skipped that. He didn't feel quite well. But this last week, he did have his conference with the Pacific Island nations, and this is significant. So um, there were uh, 18 member islands and 18 member nations in the Pacific Islands. They're called the Pacific Island Forum. And they had a, uh, a summit with uh, the president this last week. Uh, this is a big deal because under China's Belt and Road Initiative, China is also building fishing ports and shipping container ports and infrastructure in many places throughout the world. And the Pacific Islands is a hot spot for them. So this competition between China and their Belt and Road in the United States with this like-minded countries in this, um, this establishment against potential Chinese incursion, this competition is really heating up. Um, the funny thing, not it's not really funny, but the Solomon Islands, uh, the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands refused to join this, and he's leaning more towards China. So this is a big ticket item if you... Um, if you cut from the pack and you're a little bit more friendly with China, there's, there's huge benefits to be gained there. And um, it's not just a, a cut and dried deal. So this competition uh, diplomatically, geopolitically going on in the, in the Pacific and, uh, you know, in the waters towards the Philippines, um, Taiwan and Japan just continues to increase. And it is a, a worrying flashpoint. There are a lot of other things that are going on that we could talk about. I don't want to take up much more time I think I've gone on. But I think with the prime minister, with the, uh, um, the Abe faction, uh, with the gradual rise of Mr. Hagi Uda within the leadership of the Abe faction, uh, this, dis this kind of dispute that was held between the prime minister's office and the LDP, Mr. Hagi Uda is pretty influential within the LDP, even though the president of the LDP is the prime minister. Um, there are um, deals that need to be cut, and Mr. Hagiuda's um, uh, prominence continues to rise. And this is going on in a in a, um, a, a time when the Abe faction, the largest faction within the LDP, still doesn't have a defined uh, central leader. It has a team of 15 people. Within that 15 people is a more exclusive five-member team, and then everybody is a kind of coalesced together by a chairman of the group, but it's not a leader and it's not the, the main spokesman for, um, for the Abe faction with the prime minister, which is fine for the prime minister having uh, the uh, largest political faction a little bit um, off their, off their um, balance a little bit is good for him and it helps him kind of manage uh, the, the guiding of policy and, and the government in general. But I think with the um, extraordinary diet session and before we um, uh, emerge into the new year, I think you're going to see 
some settlement of issues with the Abe faction because it just can't stand uh, this way. There's too much um, uh, value to be had by negotiating toe to toe with the prime minister with the largest political faction in the LDP. So uh, we'll wait to see how that shakes out. I'll continue to report on it and keep you apprised. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. I hope this has been um, insightful and valuable to you. Uh, please continue to join us every week on Sunday at 820 when we talk about what's going on in contemporary Japanese politics that's important to you. Please continue to provide uh, comments and suggestions. Hit your like button. Continue to subscribe to uh, Japanese Politics One-on-One. -on -one. Thank you very much. Maya? Thank you, Timothy. Well, okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, just doing, um, you know, some technical work in the background. I, I apologize for the background noise in your ear pods, pods or whatever. Okay, so thank you very much for that. And I have a couple of questions and then we'll move, you know, to the comments and questions uh, in Clubhouse and also on LinkedIn. Um, first of all, you mentioned, uh, and oh, you have said this a couple of times already, everybody here knows that um, the Abe faction uh, currently has an extended leadership of 15 people on the board and then five people as uh, leaders. And uh, my question to you is actually, do you think that this is going to uh, affect or affect, uh, affect um, you know, the general election of, uh, uh, well, next year, let's say, uh, this extended leadership? Because we know that when we have an extended leadership, so basically uh, there are more um, disagreements within the faction, right? And then these disagreements, uh, they can uh, basically... Uh, let's say water down the direction or you know the they dilute uh, dilute yes uh, well let's say the decisiveness of right. uh, you know of the leaders there so do you think that uh, this will have a negative effect uh, on uh, the election general election maybe next year in september or even earlier um it's a good question it's a little bit too early to tell there are two really prominent there are actually five prominent people within the um, Abe faction who are prime ministerial quality uh, people. Um, the two that I'm thinking of, so when Mr. Abe was prime minister, he did not endorse anybody in his political faction to succeed him. He actually endorsed Ms. Takaichi, who was speaking at the forum I, I spoke about earlier and, and lambasting China for uh, their trade policies and the nasty things that they're doing uh, to Japanese companies and to Japanese citizens who reside there. Um, he endorsed her. She's an independent. She doesn't belong to a political faction, in fact. So the fact that she holds such a position of, of high authority without the endorsement of a political faction, that's amazing. So that tells you she has some kahunas. She is really somebody to contend with. Um, she's very skillful at what she does, and she has a high degree of respect. I don't know if she'll be a candidate for uh, prime minister uh, without Mr. Abe, but I think uh, the two people that really come to mind as potential candidates within the Abe faction are Mr. Nishimura, who is the minister of METI, and Mr. Hagiura, who is in charge of um, uh, the political landscape within the LDP. Um, and so the Abe faction will not support two candidates to become prime minister. They'll coalesce their forces. And in fact, I think um, it is not inaccurate to say if the Abe faction got their act together and promoted a single individual to be prime minister, that person would become prime minister. I, I think that that's, if they really put their heart to it, they could do that. Um, but of course, Mr. Nishimura wants to be first and not Mr. Hagiura. And Mr. Hagiura thinks that maybe Mr. Nishimura should, you know, wait his turn or whatever. I mean, it's politics and these kinds of sensitivities. I, I don't want you to be leader because if I can't be leader, I don't want you to be leader. And that's why they've got 15 people that are steering this, this massive machine, 99 people, compared to the second largest uh, political faction, which is 54 people. So it's a, it's a value and it's a force to be reckoned with that just hasn't coalesced. But what what you're saying is this um, indecisiveness has diluted their power. Absolutely. No, no question about it. But when it comes time to uh, select a leader for the LDP, 
and thereby becoming prime minister, I think that they, uh, there's just too much gain to be had for them to dally much longer. But the fight is between these five people who um, occupy that inner sanctum within the Ave faction and who they will come to terms with. And sometimes you can, um, you can barter that. You can you know, promise people that uh, next time will be your turn. I promise. And we have heard that before. There are lots of examples in Japanese politics where people have said that and they've reneged on it. Um, Mr. Suga is an example of, you know, coming to, uh, to the fore and then him having one term and then um, losing to Mr. Kishida. So, and he's not out either. Uh, he's uh, potentially a candidate for prime minister as well. So the prime minister needs to do his best to make sure that the cabinet that he's selected is clean and scandal free. I don't know if he's going to be able to achieve that. The second thing he needs to do is get the economy going and get wages coming up so that people feel a little bit more appreciation for him. He's got to somehow generate more revenue. And he came back from New York with ideas about, you know, the new economy and uh, encouraging foreign companies to uh, more actively invest in, in Japan and to, to hopefully um, make the, uh, the financial center, which now uh, was in Hong Kong and is now in Singapore, uh, to come to Japan, it doesn't look like that's going to happen, although the governor of, of the city of Tokyo would very much like to have that. Um, it just There are too many big hurdles, and Singapore has a lot of those hurdles already solved. Um, so, yeah, a, a lot. I mean, it's too early to say right now. Uh, we're just, we haven't even moved into the extraordinary diet session. Uh, as we move towards the end of the year, I think uh, some of the direction will be established. And then certainly once we get into um, March or April, then I think um, things will become really, really exciting and uh, really hot. But I don't anticipate that there would be a snap election. I don't think that there will be enough um, knives coming out and ministers falling on their swords that the prime minister needs to shuffle the cabinet again. I don't think so. I think this this cabinet is good for the ride, but you just never know. We're going to keep uh, keep watching that, but it's a great, great question. Well, thank you for answering it. And, uh, well, we're moving to the comments in Clubhouse now. So we've got uh, quite, okay, well, actually a few of them. We have Mario's uh, comment there. Uh, it is about uh, wages in Japan and uh, the economy. So uh, Mario wrote, Higher overseas wages and the current currency situation are also motivating a growing number of English-speaking young people to go abroad to work. And uh, yeah, it, it seems to be a, well, a growing trend here uh, as well. And then uh, Mario continues, at the same time, less cheap overseas labor is coming to Japan. Bad exchange rates add to the already poor pay. So your thoughts on this? Uh, Timothy, you can absolutely. So there, it's it's kind of a double crunch, as Mario said. People who can speak English, or maybe they had a home stay, or they traveled when they were in high school or college uh, to foreign countries, um, they come back here. They don't see the options so great, uh, and they want to enhance their their lifestyle. They're not that interested in perhaps getting married right now. So yeah, there's a there's a time in your life where you can be a little bit adventurous. And these people are um, going in droves to Australia, uh, sucking in a lot of them. The United States, uh, um, a, a good portion too, but many going to, to Europe. Uh, the opposite of that, if foreigners coming into Japan, it's, um, it needs to be more robust. But what we're talking about there are not the, um, the Americans and the Australians and the, the business types. It's mostly what Japan needs are at the lower level, uh, workers, construction, um, you know, laborers, and that sort of thing. Most of those people are coming in from Southeast Asian countries. So they've relaxed some of the restrictions, some of the visa requirements, and that sort of thing. But the reason why people do that is not only to have a better life than they have in their home country, but also when they come to Japan, they're going to be able to remit some of their wages back home. Um, and as we all know for the Philippines, for example, this is one of their largest, um, you know, uh, markets is the remittances that are provided by Filipinas who travel all over the world, who work uh, manual labor or, or as maids or work in, in 
the various industries, uh, hotel industries, food industries, and they remit uh, their wages back to the Philippines. It's a huge boost to the economy. Unfortunately, with the yen being as it is right now, there's not a whole lot to share when they um, when they get their paychecks. And plus, Japan has made some real big stumbles in treating foreign workers um, discriminatorily and, uh, you know, hitting them with sticks and, you know, taking their uh, wages or hiding their passport. It's There's just a lot of stories. It's not, um, you know, just a, a snapshot at, at Japan. It happens everywhere, but the, the stories here in Japan tend to um, carry a bigger impact to the home markets, to Vietnam, to Sri Lanka, to India. And um, so it does diminish that a little bit. But I think many people uh, acknowledge the fact that Japan is really in a labor crunch. And where are these people going to come from? You, we've tried getting the women more engaged in the economy. That hasn't quite worked as well. The OECD um, uh, uh, research, the analysis of 100 and 36 countries puts Japan at 125 in terms of parity, in terms of women participating in the economy. So they have a long way to go. And although there seems to be a little bit of energy devoted to it, it just doesn't seem to be enough with the LDP in, in power. They're a little bit conservative, even with Mr. Abe talking about, you know, let's, you know, let's encourage women to join the workforce and, and, you know, let's put them, for example, in the cabinet, you know, there are five five women, actually six women in the new um, administration, meaning the cabinet and the LDP. Uh, this is the largest number since 2014. So he is pushing for that. The second layer down, the vice ministers, there are no, there are no women. So it does have this uh, feeling of being just window dressing. Um, so the, the labor crunch is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real hard one to, to overcome. Um, one idea, if the women aren't going to do it and you can't produce babies quick enough to facilitate the need now, then open the doors to the foreigners. And um, that is somewhat still distasteful. And not only is it distasteful to people who are trying to maintain and preserve what is the essence of the Japanese culture here, but for the foreigners that come in, it's just it's difficult. The learning curve is so steep here. The language is, is a, a huge barrier. You can uh, speak English exclusively in Tokyo, but once you go out of the, the, um, the uh, Tokyo proper, you know, the ability to speak English or for shopkeepers or people who work in the trains or the, the uh, hotel industry, uh, that just drops down to um, very close to zero. So it really, um, it really is a, a tough nut to crack. But thanks for the question and the observation, Mario. Yeah, thank you. And I also think that uh, we we should uh, think about uh, the labor force, a senior labor force here, because uh, a lot of people generally, I mean, the population uh, of Japan is generally healthier than the population in other parts of the world. Yeah. And, uh, when, uh, you know, people become 60 years old or even 65 or 70, they are still um, very able to work and many of them um, well people i know for example they are willing to work actually they're not ready to say oh i i just want to take my you know retirement uh, you know the pension and uh, go home and travel and so on it's i think that uh, we also need to factor in that uh, part of the population because they have the experience they have the knowledge and many of them are really willing to continue working because they don't want to be unrelevant anymore. So, yes, and Mario says they have to work for the money. Well, I guess that's true too, Mario, but uh, also I believe that there is there is something more than just the money there. Because I remember when I was in my previous previous work workplace, uh, so my boss, actually, he was already 70 and he was still going strong. And he didn't have, didn't want to actually retire, you know, because of, uh, um, well, all the relevance and, uh, you know, the meaning that uh, work gave him. So this is probably, I don't think it's just me, but I believe no. that. Uh, if, yeah. if, if you don't mind me jumping in there, Maya, both of us know, since we work in this industry, we know lots of bureaucrats who have had a career and then they get to be 60 years old or 61 years old and they, they need to retire. The law says that they are supposed to retire. And these are people that we, we know personally. 
and um, you know they no longer have a place to go. They're at home. Their wife is not very pleased with it because throughout their career, she's had the house to herself and she's had tea with her friends and she's she's a, she's had her own lifestyle. And now she has to take care of this guy and he's always there and he, he you know, bring me a beer and turn the, turn the channel for me and it's a little bit hot in here, please turn, you know. They just, uh, they really don't know how to deal with it. And not only that, but these guys, they, they retire. They don't have any friends. They don't have any hobbies. They don't know what to do with themselves. And at least on the bureaucratic side, they joined the bureaucracy or they joined the government early in their career, maybe right after finishing college. So they've been in the entire time and they get a nice pension. They don't have to work, as Mario said. Um, they, they, you know, for the bureaucrats, they do have money. They have a lot of skill. They have a lot of knowledge. But, um, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a huge number of people every year that are pumped into uh, the labor force, but you know it's the unemployed labor force, and we know these people. But yes, if if they had something fruitful to do, I think that they would um, they would pick it up. But once again, they're not in their thirties anymore. They don't have the energy and the the, the vigor that they once had. So they're not going to be soldiers. But yeah, at the at the upper end, yeah, their strategic thinking and. Um, you know, the, the kinds of negotiation skills that they have, but not everybody has that need. You know, a lot of companies, they just need, they need laborers, they need soldiers to do things, and they've already got a management structure. So please do it the way that we like it, not the way that you like it. So it's, it's a complicated right. issue. It is indeed. And Mario, I agree with you that the majority actually, uh, well, regular workers, they have to work as safety guards, truck drivers, or similar. Unfortunately, that's true. But uh, yeah, this I, I believe that uh, there are quite a lot of structural changes in the labor force that depend not only on the government, but also on the corporations and the companies that uh, you know that will employ those people well, as well. Maya, didn't we have a discussion just last week? Who was the uh, the Vietnamese PhD candidate? Oh, we have. Oh, you may um, Lin. Lin. So Lin. Lin Lynn brought up the issue about a middle power, Japan falling from the mm -hmm. third largest economy in the world to falling down to something like number five, probably number 10 uh, in, in the world. And then their ability to be comfortable with that, it is a, a reality that is inescapable with the number of people declining. And they're declining across the world. It's just that Japan, the, the, um, the, the population pyramid has been inverted and there are so many older people supported by younger people, the number of people. And it's not unique to Japan. It's just that um, because Japan's economy is somewhat unique and they had this economic miracle, it's more advanced than a lot of other countries. But there are a lot of other countries whose uh, population distribution mimics Japan's uh, five years ago or 10 years ago. So how Japan deals with it will be an example of how other countries deal with it as well. But um, I think the reality, rather than uh, trying to talk about how we're going to get AI involved and how uh, the number of truck drivers is going to be alleviated because we're going to have autonomous vehicles, or how the number of people who are in the workforce are going to be alleviated because we're going to have more foreigners coming in, I think inevitably Japan just needs to be um, comfortable with the fact, they need to acknowledge the fact that they're not going to be the number three economy in the world. And there are other companies, countries that are coming up uh, really strong. And so it, it's important for us to watch this and to anticipate this and to prepare for it because there, not only are there market opportunities, but there are also risks and challenges that we need to anticipate. Um, many of the people in our audience are foreigners who study Japan or uh, it's part of their, their um, obligation to their company or to their ministry to be apprised of what's going on in Japan. And then a lot of the other uh, audience members, they're they're in Japan. They live in Japan. They're Japan hands, and to anticipate what that is, it's part of your obligation to your uh, to your employer or to your ministry to be a, abreast of this sort of thing, be able to anticipate it. And I hope um, this this program, this briefing uh, every week, helps you a, a anticipate and appreciate that. Yes, thank you for that. And. Uh... Well, so uh, one more thing, we are going now to uh, LinkedIn, the comments there, we've got Daniel, uh, and uh, 
the topic there is actually let me have a look at it yes it's about um, yes the stimulus uh, and the stimulus packages that the government has been pushing out and um, as you mentioned on linkedin timothy uh, come autumn every year we have a new package so and uh, of course uh, people just wonder where does all that money come from because uh, well, all those uh, stimulus, uh, stimulus packages, they come from tax money, maybe from some new printed money, uh, and probably a combination anyway of both. And Daniel there, uh, he commented, no more stimulus. It doesn't work. It's a temporary fix and actually creates incentives against fundamental change. So I believe that uh, most of the people uh, listening to us will, will agree with this uh, comment. But at the same time, what drives the government to, to push out these stimulus packages, even though they don't work? Because it's, it's more of the same every year, and we don't really see much of a positive effect there. Okay, so stimulus packages do work. It's just that they're expensive. They're not expensive right now for the administration who is doiling them out. It's the same thing with the Biden administration with the budget that they have, you know, the billions of dollars um, that they have doiled out. And people are wondering where that money comes from, comes from. Similarly, here in Japan, we know the mechanism for it. Japan, uh, the Japanese government sells bonds and the bonds generate a um, guaranteed revenue on a 10 year basis. So if you have extra money and lots of companies are flush with cash and you can redistribute that cash, you can pay higher wages, you can purchase more land or equipment, you can uh, embed more technology, or you can buy Japanese government bonds because the return that that generates for you 10 years down the road, and if you've been doing this every year, um, every year you're getting the benefit of the, that revenue that's coming in. And so for a lot of companies, they continue to buy Japanese government bonds. The way it is right now in Japan is that the Japanese government itself has purchased more than 50% of the bonds. So it's the Japanese government holding its own debt. It's not supposed to be like that. Um, having the Japanese government participate by purchasing the shares of um, different companies, for example, Japan Tobacco or NTT. Yes, the Japanese government is a um, significant shareholder of that. And that is to generate revenue to pay off some of these bonds. But the bonds for the person who is in administration, like, for example, uh, Mr. Kishida now, the way to create that surplus that he's doiling out, he gets the Bank of Japan to issue more bonds. And actually, part of this stimulus package is the stimulus package that was earmarked for COVID two years ago or three years ago that was left unspent. They really went overboard. They um, had a bigger uh, supplemental package and they didn't burn through it. So it keeps getting passed down. So part of it is being robbed from there. I don't think robbed is the right word, but it's being reallocated to a, um, the current surplus. But the, um, the, the piper needs to be paid at some point in time. And that's the children and the grandchildren, the great grandchildren of the people who are alive now. And the dream is that they're so brilliantly genius that they fixed it right and they, 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 um, they pumped the well with enough um, energy that it begins to, to regenerate itself. So that's what the prime minister has talked about, of regenerating the economy. You put investment in, it generates a revenue, you pay higher wages, it generates more investment the investment generates more revenue. That is this virtuous cycle that he has been talking about ever since he's been prime minister. And it really hasn't come to fruition. So we'll see. Um, but absolutely, people are curious how much money, where does this money come from? It's for the flood victims. It's for the fishers that um, are suffering because of the, uh, the release of the nuclear um, tainted water, the um, water from the Fukushima reactor. Um, it's, you know, everybody's got a, a pet project and um you know paying paying money so that the gasoline prices so the gasoline prices now will be subsidized that was announced this last week and the gas prices will come down to about 178 um yen to the liter i think it's near 200 right now so it's a brief period where people are paying a lot for that and i think that will be released um probably later this month so people are going to start liking the prime minister again 
but you know, time will tell. These um, these reports that we get every month or so on the um, standing of the prime minister, what people think of him and his cabinet, what his approval rating is uh, is like. These are important bellwethers that tell us his tweaks are working or they're not working. It comes a little bit after the tweaks, and the tweaks hit the economy. They hit K. Dunren. They hit um, you know the labor force. And then the appreciation kind of comes up or goes down, but that's why these um, these reports are so important because they kind of they're they're a thermometer uh, under the tongue that tells us what the what you know what they're doing is is being appreciated or it's not the right volume, it's not the right uh, velocity, that sort of thing. So um, we anticipate a um, report on the prime minister's new cabinet standing next week. Okay, good. Thanks for that. And um, well, so I believe that uh, perspective here matters and probably we're talking and looking at things in a different way, short term, long term. And uh, that's why uh, the different opinions, you know, come up. However, uh, one thing that I would like to uh, also read to you is another comment uh, on LinkedIn. It's about um, the gas subsidies. And uh, so here, government, uh, well, Daniel once again says, the government has also been increasing the cost of gas through uh, year on year uh, because of, while actually giving green energy subsidies. Yep. And um, so this is like give with one hand and take with the other. So your thoughts on this, Timothy, again. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, that's a really big issue. It, it actually delves into a, a different area, the uh, green transformation that is being promoted by the prime minister. Among the G20 nations, Japan has the most aggressive and uh, Mr. Kishida is getting accolades throughout the world for his aggressive stance on uh, bringing Japan into a carbon neutral economy. So he gets lots of accolades for that. And he's um, really pushing on renewable energy. And that's why the um, arrest uh, and the finally charged uh, the diet member, the lower house diet member, who was really instrumental in moving green technology on behalf of uh, the administrative state, uh, not particularly uh, Mr. Uh, Kishida's cabinet, but uh, an individual who is very close to uh, Konotaro and also to Mr. Suga in uh, promoting renewable energy. He got caught taking a bribe. We talked about this two weeks ago. He was arrested. He and the person who made the bribe, the president of a, a wind farm uh, operation, were uh, arrested and charged. It is un We don't know right now if he's going to resign. He's going to turn his uh, diet badge in. He's going to take the blame for it. I kind of think, uh, reading the press reports, that he's not going to. He's going to fight this and say it wasn't a bribe or it, it was, you know, whatever his reason's going to be. But having the LDP lose yet another member because of this kind of scandal is probably not good timing for the prime minister. So I don't think he's he's done that. But the green transformation has taken a hit because of this. This is one of the leaders of of this transformation. So. On the one hand, the prime minister is trying to push up the price of uh, fossil fuels and the use of fossil fuels so that, yes, people will buy the uh, electric vehicles, they'll buy more solar panels, they'll be more encouraged. In fact, every house that is built in Tokyo, the 23 wards of Tokyo, every house that is built in this uh, metropolis now needs to have solar panels on its roof. It's mandated. So it's not nationwide, but you know, 10% of the entire country lives in the uh, metropolitan uh, me megalopolis of Tokyo. 10% uh, of the entire nation lives in this this area. So it is a big deal, and the um, uh, uh, carbon neutral transformation by 2030. I mean, it's 2023 right now, seven years away, six years away to achieve those kinds of goals. Something really aggressive has to happen. And um, with the price of the fossil fuels and the gas and the heating oil and that sort of thing being so high, it means that the electorate, the electorate is not very happy with the prime minister. So he's got to, he's got to uh, dangle that. He's got to keep those prices low so that people like him a little bit more so that he can at some point maybe have a snap election or indeed return to be prime minister this time next year, at the same time, he's got to meet his, um, his pronounced goals and meeting, you know, the, 
the Kyoto Protocol and carbon neutrality in 2050. So there's a lot going on there. And um, a lot of the heroes, a lot of the champions of this within the diet are jockeying for position because this will be a, a major um, uh, issue for, for election and for the economy coming up. It isn't right now, but it is going to be within the next couple of years. Well, thank you for that too. Okay, and we have another question, uh, this time once again from Christopher. Uh, in Clubhouse, it's a general question and it is uh, about your thoughts. So what do you think are some of the things we should take note of with regards to geopolitics in the coming two weeks? Okay, that's a great question. Um, you might have noticed that uh, the prime minister was sitting next to Zelensky um, at the UN. Um, and they also had their private meeting and an exchange of information on funding. So I don't know, I mean, the United States is fully behind uh, Ukraine and Japan is somewhat honor bound to do what the United States says. And you can see uh, this prime minister in particular, I, you saw it with, with Mr. Abe as well, is really, um, Whoever the president is, he's kissing up to him. If it's Trump, if it's uh, Bush, um, if it's Biden, uh, Japan has tied their star to the United States. So in particular with Mr. Kishida, when the United States has made a public, public pronouncement, Japan um, in, implements or pursues it or issues a press release within 24 hours. It's uncanny how tightly these two political um, economies are tied together. So um, for, for Japan, I think uh, Ukraine is one, even though uh, they have other issues going. The economy is the other one. And of the economy, wages are really important because domestic growth is supposed to be the engine of growth for any economy. And in this economy, it is not. It's external demand for Japanese products. That is the engine for growth. And among that engine of growth for external demand is Japanese automobiles. So Japan is a little bit lopsided in reliance on the automobile and automobile parts. That industry supports the Japanese economy where it should be domestic demand is, uh, is the engine. And without wages, without people feeling hope and confidence in the economy, they're not going to buy a new car. They're, they're going to still stick with their older car. They're not going to buy a new refrigerator. They're not going to take a vacation. They're not going to go on a holiday. Um, they're not going to buy a house. They're not going to have any children. So that is the, uh, the conundrum that the, um, that the prime minister has. And then I think, um, thirdly, uh, Japan moving towards a military industrial complex. The United States has just announced it is going to establish space force here in, in Japan. They're looking for a site uh, to establish the entity here. And that means that Japan will be a component of the United States Space Force. It already is. Um, it's just not very much talked about. The Self-Defense Forces has the Army, the, uh, not the Army, has the um, ground forces, the air forces, and the naval forces. And um, the United States just launched under President Trump a new um, uh, force called the Space Force. And it's actually um, doing great guns. Um, and not a lot of it is reaching the public eye. But the, the United States has established with Japan as probably one of their most important allies to also take part in that. So we don't know what Japan's role is going to be on it. But it is similar to you know Japan um, pronouncing it wants to join the UN or, or be a component of the UN or maybe even, uh, I'm sorry, not the UN, NATO. It wants to have a NATO office in Tokyo or be like NATO as the fulcrum in the Pacific for these like-minded countries. So I think that is another one. Japan has a lot to uh, earn in terms of uh, defense capabilities and offensive capabilities and selling armaments, uh, creating um, you know, a market for that. Uh, the Constitution, as we know, doesn't allow that, doesn't allow the Japanese country or the Japanese industry to produce offensive weapons. Even with dual use, there are lots of restrictions there, but I think the movement is toward developing a, uh, a defense industry. Um, and I think the, the prime minister is a little bit um, dovish on that side, um, probably a more hawkish prime minister 
should the prime minister change, I think you're going to see that ramping up uh, really quick. And then the discussion about what we do with Article 9 of the Constitution that restricts Japan from doing that. And I think you're going to see that within the next five years. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the answer, uh, Christopher. I hope that uh, Timothy answered your question. So uh, with this, Timothy, it looks like uh, we have gone through the comments and questions in uh, the social media we are currently live streaming on. Okay. And uh, well, this means that uh, we can let you go and <laughs> you can enjoy your Sunday. So thank you very much indeed uh, for being here with us and deliver, delivering this uh, briefing to everybody who joined us in Clubhouse, LinkedIn, and also um, YouTube and uh, Facebook. Thanks a lot for sticking with us. We'll be here once again next Sunday at 8.20. I'll be more careful next time when I schedule the time um, and uh, the briefing. Yes, okay. So let me have a look. Somebody had their hand raised in Clubhouse, but uh, that notification disappeared. So uh, since I cannot uh, do that, that's it. Okay, we have something from Hiroko here. Just you had me all excited now. Right. Oh, so this is a thank you for another Hiroko great time. From, yes, from Hiroko-san. Thank you, Hiroko. And uh, well, that's all for today. It's a beautiful day despite the clouds. Hopefully it will not rain. So to everybody, enjoy your weekend and we'll see you next Sunday again. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Maya. Thanks, everybody. See you next week.